Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm into my fourth week of teaching, uh, The Power of Hope. And this is a new CD set that I've been putting out, and this is my fourth week of teaching, and so we've already covered a lot of materials. And on our program yesterday, I was talking quite a bit about your emotions and how that if we are really hoping in the Lord, if our imagination is working for us instead of against us, that we will be happy and we'll have good emotions. And I've got a teaching out entitled Harnessing Your Emotions, and it would go along perfectly with the things that I've been saying the last few days and also what I'll be talking about today. So I've been trying to establish that if we are truly operating in hope, then there will be joy and rejoicing in our life. Here's another verse that says the same thing. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 28 says, The hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. So if you are hoping, if you are a righteous person, that means in right standing with God, and if your hope is truly in God, then gladness is the byproduct of it. In Romans chapter 5, verse 2, it says, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. If you were to take this in its context, it's talking about that we aren't only glorying in, in the good times, but we glory in bad times because even in the bad things, your faith is going to be tried and your, your uh, hope will make not a shame. And stuff, and so it's talking about that even in tough times we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know, if you missed my program yesterday, again, I encourage you to go back and get these materials and get this. But I made a major point of this yesterday that most people don't operate in hope. Hope is the ability to see things on the inside that you can't see with your physical eyes. And hope is specifically talking about the positive things that God's Word promises. And sad to say, most Christians are not operating in hope. They are limited to only what they see in this physical world with their physical eyes. And the truth is, we live in a fallen world and there's just bad things happening. You know, there's a lot of bad things that happen in each individual person's life. And then now, because of our communication that we have today, you can see the problems that are happening all over the world in real time. And you get them pumped into your home on a daily basis. Many of you have alerts on your iPhone where they bring all of the bad news of the world to you. And you know what? If all you're doing is looking at things in the natural, if all you are doing is just seeing with your physical eyes, and if you aren't seeing with your heart, with your imagination, which is what the Bible calls hope, then I guarantee you something's wrong with you if you aren't, aren't depressed. If you aren't depressed living in this world, then you aren't paying attention or you are operating in hope. You are seeing things through the promises of the Word of God instead of just with your natural eyes. This is what this is talking about, that, that w with, uh, when you're operating in faith, you do rejoice in hope of the glory of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. If you are truly believing, you will be rejoicing with joy unspeakable and full of glory. If you aren't rejoicing, it's because you aren't operating in hope. You aren't believing God. You aren't trusting God. And I know that there's many, many people who are who feel like I'm condemning people by saying that. I'm not condemning. I'm not trying to say that you're a bad person, but I am trying to say that you don't have to live that way. We've even had a large segment of the body of Christ today that teach that you have to go through all this grief and you have to go through all these hardships and up and down and, and you're just emotionally unstable and they teach that this is actually a good thing, that this is the way God created us to be. Again, I say emphatically not. The Lord would be unjust to give you a command to let not your heart be troubled. 
talking to his disciples the night before his crucifixion. He would be unjust to say, in the world you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He would be unjust to say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He would be unjust to give those commands if you couldn't fulfill it. If it was just, if we were just doomed, destined to be up and down emotionally in every little thing that happens, if a person dies, if a person criticizes you, if, the, if you lose your job, if all of these things happen, you just have to have these emotional problems. If that was the way that God intended for it to be, then he would be unjust to give us these commands that talk about rejoicing always, even in the midst of tribulation. I tell you, that is not true. I'm not saying that you can avoid all problems. We can avoid a lot of problems if we would seek the Lord, but we live in a fallen world. There are going to be bad things happen to good people, but if your hope is in the Lord, if you are truly trusting in Him, you can rejoice knowing that regardless of what the devil throws at you, it's going to work, turn around. God's going to work it together for good. And if not in this life, in eternity, you will be totally immune to all of these things. I tell you, that's powerful. Romans chapter 12, verse 12 says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. If you are truly operating in hope, if your hope, if your ability to see with your heart God's word and God's promises to you come into pass, if those things are operating in you, you will rejoice. Again, I know that there's a lot of people saying, that you can't believe this. It, it isn't true. You can't do that. Well, I'm reading scripture to you. You're going to have to argue with the word because this is what the word says. Romans chapter 15 verse 13 says, Now that God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice that the God of hope fills you with all joy and peace. Joy and peace ought to accompany believing, hope, that you may, be, uh, that you may abound in hope. If you have truly God's hope, if your hope is really stayed in the Lord, I can guarantee you there is going to be joy and peace in your believing. If you're tormented, if you are dreading something, if you are distressed, stressed out over stuff, worried and careful and all these kind of things, then I can promise you your hope is not where it should be. You aren't really operating in hope. You know, again, I could give you a lot of personal examples on this, but I've been in many, many situations that in the natural, if it wasn't for God and what He's done in my life, I, I would have been stressed out. I would have been discouraged. I would have been depressed. I've been tempted with those exact same things, the same as anybody else. But I can tell you that because I have a hope that is anchored in Jesus, and I have spent time hoping in the Lord, there's been times where there is just no reason in the natural, but my hope calls me to have joy and peace and keep from falling apart. I tell you, that's powerful. You know, my wife and I watched a movie last night. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm not against the movie. Overall, it was a very good movie. But there was a couple of things in this movie that just grated on me at the first, and it was because a person was feeling stressed out, and they could, there was no reason for it. Their life was just perfect, but there was something in their genes. It had to do with their, their parents and things like this. And so it made a statement that basically sometimes these things are just genetic. And then they found out something that just, I mean, in one day's time when they found this thing out, they said, my whole life is gone. I don't know who I am. And I just really resent the fact that, see, that movie, although it w turned out good and the end result of it was good, that movie established that sometimes your emotional things are just genetic. It's the way that's programmed on the inside of you. And then, it all, second thing it established was that, you know, something can happen and all of a sudden your life that is just going good and great and everything's great, all of a sudden it can be totally shattered. And I just don't believe that. I don't act that way. You know what? I have a hope in the Lord, and I am coming from a victory. I rehearse all of the good things that God has done, and when I have tragedy hit me and strike in my life, I'm always looking beyond that. I'm looking at what the Word of God promises me. 
You know, when my son died, I had the same temptation to grieve and to be sad, hurt, uh, feelings of just wanting to quit and give up. I had all of these emotions coming to me the same as any person would have if you found out that your son was dead. But you know what? I also had a hope. And specifically, as my wife and I, we had to get up, get dressed. It was 4.15 in the morning when we got this call that my son was dead. And we had to get up and get dressed, come into Colorado Springs. It's about an hour drive for us. And during that period of time, I just did not like these feelings of depression and grief and sorrow and things like that. And I immediately went back to the word that Jesus bore my sorrows and carried my grief. And I started speaking out loud. I said, I am not taking this grief and sorrow. I am not going to grieve over this. And then I started praising God. And I said, God, I'm going to serve you. I don't care if my son never came back to life. I don't care what happens. I refuse to be defeated and destroyed. You are not the one that killed my son. And I just started praising him. And you know what happened when I did that? The Lord brought back to my remembrance prophecy. There was two different times. I won't go into the whole deal, but one time I was over in Ireland and a woman came up to me who didn't even know if I had children, didn't know anything about me. And she says, you've got two boys. And says, the younger is going to turn to the Lord and start serving God before the older one and gave me all of these very specific prophecies, which there was no way for her to know. And I mean the very fact that it was so specific and from somebody who knew nothing about me to me, that really established that this was God. And then I was in California one time, and I was praying for people, and it was like 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. A person came in after the service was over and stood in line, and I got to them, and I said, what do you need prayer for? And they said, God sent me here to give you a prophecy. And they said, you've got two boys. And again, it was a person who had never seen me before, knew nothing about me, and said, you've got two boys the younger one's going to turn to the Lord and started prophesying nearly word for word what I got over in Ireland. And so neither one of these people knew me. I knew that it had to be God. They each confirmed the prophecy. And as I was driving into the springs to go check on my son, the younger son, who had died and had been dead for about five hours, as I was driving in, I just started praising God and saying, I am not going to let this defeat me. And all of a sudden, these prophecies came back to my remembrance. And I realized that these were prophecies that were from God. They weren't just man-made. They weren't somebody saying their own things. These had to be words from God. I had accepted them, and I started realizing that if they were truly from God, which I knew they were, then my son had to live because the things that were in those prophecies had not come to pass yet. And you know what that did? That's hope. That's hope. All of a sudden, instead of just looking at things in the natural and the fact that my son had been dead for four hours, instead of just looking at things in the natural, hope came up in my heart. And I began to look past that physical thing. And I saw the Word of God, not just the written Word of God, but the prophesied, spoken Word of God that came to me. It painted a hope on the inside of me and I realized that for those prophecies to come to pass, my son had to come back to life. And I started praising God. I started laughing. I told Jamie, I said, this is going to be the greatest thing that we've ever seen. And, you know, praise God for a godly wife. She knew enough. She knew about the power of words. She wasn't going to counter me, and she wasn't going to speak unbelief. But I think she probably was thinking that I had lost my mind, that I had just flipped out. Because here I was laughing at, on the way in to the morgue to pick up our son who had died. And I started telling her, this is going to be the greatest thing we've ever seen. And when we got into the hospital, my oldest son met me at the door. And he said, Dad, I don't know what happened. But five or ten minutes after I called you, Peter just sat up and started talking. They had already stripped him naked. They would put a toe tag on him. They put him in a freezer in the morgue. And he sat up and started talking. And when we got there, he was totally coherent. And we talked to him and praised God. The Lord brought him back to life with no brain damage. Even after being dead for nearly five hours, between four and five hours, there was no brain damage, no more than he had before. Praise God. And you know what did that? 
hope. Now, I knew what the Word of God said. I knew the promises. I knew that the Bible says that the works that you do, that I do, shall you do also. And I had all of that, and I had my faith there, and I had already spoken in faith. My wife and I had agreed and commanded our son to come back to life. And we had all of the knowledge, and we had faith, but I tell you, when hope kicked in, and all of a sudden, I saw my son alive and not dead. You know, I just don't have the words to explain this to you. But I, I knew what the Word said. I had done what the Word said. I spoke the Word. I acted on the Word. I wasn't contradicting it with my actions or with my speech. I was doing all of the right things. And I don't know exactly how everything works, but I, I tend to believe that if I hadn't have had the Lord quicken my hope, and if those prophecies hadn't have come back to my remembrance, and if I hadn't have seen my son alive from the dead, I'm not sure that he would have come back from the dead. I'm not sure that just standing on the word and speaking forth the word and doing it with, I, I was doing it in faith. I, I didn't do it in fear or doubt or it wasn't desperation. But I'm, I don't know how, how to say this, but I'm just telling you that when hope exploded in my heart and I saw that Peter was going to be raised from the dead is when it happened. And I'm telling you that there's some of you watching this program right now that you know what the Word says and you have said the Word. I mean, you've spoken it. You are straight as a gun barrel, but you are twice as empty. There isn't any hope. You need to take all of these things that you believe in, these promises of God, and you need to sit down and let the Word of God paint a picture on the inside of you of your health, of your prosperity, of your success, of your marriage being healed, of relationships being healed, whatever it is that you're believing for. You need to go beyond just saying and standing on the Word to where you see it in your heart. Again, I feel like I struggle with words sometimes to express these things, but this is what all of these verses are talking about. That when you get into hope, there is joy and peace in believing. That was Romans chapter 15 verse 13. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, he says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Did you know that sorrow here is linked directly to a lack of hope? And it's specifically talking about people who have died. It's saying that you should not sorrow for your believing relatives who have died as others who have no hope. In other words, you shouldn't approach the death of a loved one the same way that a person who doesn't have Jesus in their life, who doesn't have a promise that we are going to be resurrected with a glorified body and live forever in eternity, you shouldn't sorrow the way that other people sorrow. You know, really, if you understand and if you have the hope, now see, the reason it's a hope is because you can't make it a reality right now. The physical resurrection of the dead you can see individuals raised from the dead, but the physical resurrection of the living and the dead is something that is not a reality now. It is still off in the future, so it's in the hope realm. But if you hope for that, if you believe that God is going to raise you and your loved ones from the dead, that we will be reunited, that we will live for eternity in heaven, well then really death of a loved one is nothing more than just saying goodbye. And I'll see you later. And it may be years, but you will be reunited with that person. You know, my mother lived until she was 96 years old. And when she was 95 years old, she actually uh, had some things happen and they pronounced that she wouldn't be able to live through the night. And so I was with her and I remember talking to this nurse, and the nurse showed me these statistics. I can't remember what they were now, but it was about her liver and her kidneys and all of these other things. And she says, here's normal, and your mother's way up here says she can't live more than 24 hours. So anyway, they put her into hospice care and things like this, and my mother lived for another nine months. 
And she specifically told me, don't you dare pray that God heals me. She was ready to go home. And I went, and there was, during those nine months, I bet you I probably went and saw her. She lived about 10 hour drive away. And I went and saw her at least four or five times. It might have been six or seven. I went really often and stayed there a week or more at a time to just be with her. And every time, you know, um, she would revive and stuff. And so I'd say goodbye and I'll see you later. And I would go back home, but I would stay in touch with her and I knew that I'd see her again. And the very last time that I saw her, it was obvious that she was really declining in her health. And I remember telling her goodbye. And I remember thinking that this might be the last time I ever see my mother alive. And yet it really, because of the hope that I have, and because of the Word of God, it really was no different than all of the other times that I'd come to see her. And because I just knew that it was like, I'll see you later, and it doesn't matter if it's here on this earth or if it's in eternity, but I'll see my mother again. I'll see my father again. I hadn't seen my father for, it's now been 50, nearly 52 years. But you know what? I'll see him again. And when you have this hope, See, when you aren't limited to just this physical life and what you see with your eyes and feel and hear, but you are operating by faith and you're taking the Word of God, then it's just like Paul spoke to these Thessalonians that we should not sorrow as others who have no hope. It's just like saying goodbye, I'll see you later. You know, my mother, every time I'd call her and talk to her, she says, Andy, are you praying that I'll die? And I'd say, yes, mother. I'm praying that you'll die. And she says, why does it take so long for me to die? She was just ready to go. And you know what? It's not a bad thing. Death, death is never, it was not God's intent for mankind to die. That came as a result of sin. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And so this isn't God's plan. This is something that we put into effect through our disobedience. We are the ones that ushered death and destruction and all of this sickness and disease and stuff into this world. This wasn't God's plan. But since there is a fall of man, did you know that death is actually better than living forever? Could you imagine people living forever in a body racked by pain, racked by deformities, racked by suffering, and all of these kind of things? For the believer that has hope Death is not the end of the story. And praise God, we should not sorrow as others which have no hope. I tell you, that is a powerful, powerful statement. I know that there's people watching today that this is just totally different than all the other advice that you're getting. And you're thinking, man, this is strange. I'm telling you, this is normal. This is the way that God made us to be. And all of that other stuff, the way that the world is going, that's strange. They're the ones that are weird. We need to go back to the Word of God and let the Word of God build hope on the inside of you. You know, I've got a lot more to share on this, and I'm going to continue this on my program tomorrow, so I encourage you to listen in. And also listen to our announcer, because he's going to be giving you information about how you can get this teaching on the power of hope. And also, they will share with you about this book that I have entitled Harnessing Your Emotions. So listen to our announcer and then call or write today. Andrew's complete teaching titled The Power of Hope was recorded live at a recent conference. It's available on either CD or DVD. Or you can get the DVD as seen on TV. Each is available for 16 pounds. Go to awme.net to see the options. This series is also available for audio download absolutely free on our website. Go to awme.net, click on Resources at the top of the page, and then MP3 Teachings. The fourth audio teaching in today's series is titled, Looking Beyond the Natural. It's available for three pounds when you write or call, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will send this fourth CD free of charge. On today's program, Andrew talked about how hope in God can help control your emotions. A further explanation is offered in Andrew's book titled, Harnessing Your Emotions. This product is available for £8.99 when you contact us. You can use your credit card to order resources through our website at awme.net. 
While you're there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. Or you can order through our helpline Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. If the lines are busy, remember you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events. In the month of March, he'll be in Overland Park in Wichita, Kansas, Norman, Oklahoma, and Colorado Springs, Colorado. In April, he'll be in Orlando and Miami, Florida, Washington, D.C., and in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. And in May, he'll be in Atlanta, Georgia. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. We were under a curse. We were under a curse. And a lot of us Christians go to the grave without ever knowing grace. Knowing grace. Knowing grace. My name is Joe. We came out of an abusive church. Everything we did or didn't do, if we didn't do it, we were under a curse. The problem was God had been dealing with me on one particular scripture, and it was in Galatians about Jesus becoming the curse for us. And this was my heartfelt cry to the Lord. I said, Lord, did Satan have something in his back pocket, a curse that you just didn't see? Why are we always cursed? So this guy, Andrew Womack, comes on and he's sitting in a chair, he's got this monotone voice. I couldn't imagine where they got him from. Galatians 3.13 says, Jesus redeemed us. Redeem means the liberating effect that's procured by the payment of a ransom. The very thing God was dealing with me on, on that particular scripture in Galatians, Andrew was preaching on it. What he said had sat so right with me, and I said, I got a hunch. This is what I've been looking for for a long time. I believe in everybody's heart. There's a certain spot reserved for grace. Reserved for grace. It is not enough for you to have need. Need doesn't motivate God. God is motivated by His own love to meet our needs, and His power is available. But the thing that will release or appropriate this power of God is faith.